Welcome to Five Strike Weekly. Atlanta Channel has finally begun preseason for the 2020 season. We get into all the happenings and goings on coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ, and this is Tanner McLeod. Before we get into it, become part of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube or hop over from Facebook and subscribe. This video is sponsored by Burro Burro Sushi. Burro Burro Sushi is a Japanese inspired fast casual eatery that offers ramen, sushi burritos, and poke bowls. Burro Burro delivers cuisine that's ethical, delicious, and fast. Guests can create their own rice bowls and sushi burritos through an array of fresh vegetables, marinated meats, and quality sauces. Also now serving a collection of traditional Japanese ramen. It's been great seeing the squad training in preseason, and there have been a lot of news coming out from camp. First up being the hat trick that Ellie and I kind of pulled with international slots in Eric Rometty, Ezekiel Barco, and Franco Escobar essentially being uh, permanent U.S. residents and thus no longer occupying an international slot. Massive, massive, I think, uh, for LA United and kind of uh, forming the squad. Absolutely. It leaves us with four open international slots now, which is useful considering that the players that Atlanta United are rumored with bringing in would occupy international slots. But we've said it before and we'll say it again, credit to the lawyers that Atlanta United has because they clearly get the job done and get it done quickly to where Atlanta, not Atlanta United, international slots are overrated for Atlanta United specifically because yeah. they just find ways to get people green cards and sort out the whole roster situation. So it's good to have this happen and it gives a front office flexibility for the transfer window. Right, and it's also massive for when you know we were in the US Open Cup, when we had our run, we were able to play more of our players, especially uh, you know, in the first uh, year, it was a little bit difficult because we were kind of up to the gun of like, okay, we're running out of guys that are usual, usual starters for the first team. Uh, now it's we pretty much can field whatever you know we want, and that's pretty fantastic. Um, and I think you know around the league, it's maybe not as uh, you know prolific as maybe what we are able to do at times, especially for some of the Canadian clubs. I think there are some other clubs that uh, you know are wise to this as well. But uh, I think you know we kind of pulled off uh, you know something pretty clever here and there uh, in terms of roster construction for sure. So, uh, but coming up or uh, moving on from that is that a rumor has been debunked on Julian Gressel, and uh, that was a link from the uh, website SB Nation. Um, the <laughs> Excuse me, Waking guys. Waking the Red? Waking the Red. Apologies. Uh, trying to find that. Soviet Russia? Or yeah, what? <laughs> not right now. But it's for Toronto FC. They're the Reds. Okay. Uh, it just took me a second to find it. But um, yeah, essentially, they said that Julian Gressel was being linked to Toronto. Uh, but very quickly, Christian Jack, uh, the TSN reporter and host, kind of pretty much within that hour debunked it and was just saying there are no links. Uh, and that's from sources at both clubs. Uh, that are close to the situation and they just basically, uh, it's quashed completely and that's great because if he moved to Toronto, holy crap, would there be some uproar? Yeah, that's one of those things when, when I first saw the rumor, I didn't know that it was based on literally nothing, but it just didn't seem like anything that made any logical sense. I don't know what Toronto could offer in terms of allocation money or whatever in terms of paying Julian Gressel as well because they'd be in the same constraints as far as allocation money paying him and him being a TAM player that Atlanta United is. So it's like, I don't get that, but also why would Atlanta United directly strengthen one of the rivals in the Eastern Conference and the Especially team the that, one that just did knock out. you out of the MLS <laughs> Cup uh, playoffs this past season? Yeah, that just did not seem very likely to me in the slightest. So cold water, nothing to see here, move on. Yeah. Now, obviously his future is still as of yet unresolved, but I don't see him going, if he's going anywhere, I just don't see it within MLS. And if it's an MLS, it's either to a team that Atlanta United knows it can beat or someone out West that it wouldn't have to see until later, but also probably not one of the bigger teams anyway, because he's gonna be a higher earner. And if a team wants him, maybe they can make him a DP or something, but we're not gonna strengthen our direct rival. That's just not gonna happen. And Julian Russell improves any team he goes to. Right, indeed. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, maybe not quite a DP level player, but he is a high TAM player indeed. And so he definitely uh, would deserve that type of contract if he were to get it. Uh, 
Another part of that uh, was Soccer Today podcaster Dwayne Rollins saying and suggesting that uh, they Toronto might wanted to move uh, their goalkeeper Alex Bono uh, to make room for a trade for Kressel. And so that's where they were trying to make weight in terms of that. But the plausibility out the window, uh, which is, I think, relief for a lot of Atlanta United fans. Uh, but no relief in terms of his contract just quite yet. But Joseph was asked uh, in uh, the from the press this week about Gressel's contract situation, and he said, I'm just worried that they pay me. That's all I care about. Just classic Joseph in terms of deflecting anything and kind of making kind of a joke about it, which is great. He's great for those one-liners. Yeah. I mean, somebody <laughs> suggested that after his Lawton's gone now, your best one-liners and quotes are going to be coming from Joseph. And some of the things he said, they might not necessarily be wrong on that front. It's true. I mean, he might not be, uh, no, he's pretty boastful as well sometimes at times. So, you know. Like his whole rum comments yeah. and <laughs> it's just making fun of Orlando. He's a great guy and he loves the banter. And I think he's just, he exudes that self-confidence. So exactly. he knows he can back up what he, what he talks. So, but some people who don't know him, maybe you don't understand that he's joking a lot right. of the time. Yeah, I think you have to actually watch the uh, the press conferences versus like just seeing the text out of context. It's definitely, uh, yeah, you get the, the humor that he has. But uh, Julian Gressel also did not take part on uh, the full squad training on Monday. Uh, it was due to a uh, conditioning precaution, quote unquote. And he did presume uh, and resume rather, rather uh, training on Tuesday with the rest of the squad, uh, some 11 v 11s and whatnot. And so uh, good to see, yeah, there is no problem in terms of him with the, the club, at least, uh, you know, externally anyway. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully, you know, a contract gets resolved. If there isn't, I think uh, there is that kind of lingering feeling that that could happen as well. And that's, it does suck for a lot of uh, WrestleMania fans, but, um, you know, we've lost a lot of uh, kind of big names uh, in this offseason already. And that also includes LGP, who we uh, officially and finally uh, kind of the worst kept secret in the league. Uh, sold them to Cholos, to Club Tijuana. And um, yeah, it so happened to uh, kind of happen on the game day or match day for Cholos. Uh, they were going to play at 10 p.m. And then, yeah, you uh, finally get the announcement at like, I think, 3 p.m. or something. Finally. And then, uh, so, it, you know, LGBT. You get the announcement, by the way, after it leaks of him in their match day program, a picture of him exactly. in their match day program. And then it's just like, okay. Can we quit being done with this whole thing? I think one of the things, and there was a lot of speculation, I think from everyone, myself included, you know, is why is Atlanta United waiting? This is kind of a joke now, you look slightly unprofessional. But I think that was mainly because we weren't fully aware of what was happening with our new signing that we'll get into, uh, uh, Fernando Mesa. Mesa. Mesa, sorry. And He's not a native speaker. Whatever, so fight Not a mind. Um, <laughs> point being is that, Getting him from Nexacaca was actually a really- Nexacaca. Nex Nexacaca. Yeah, Nexacaca. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> Fight me. I'll yeah. learn and get better. Deal yeah, with it. It's fine. I admit to my flaws, okay? It's all good. Point being is that MLS is having a lawsuit with them over a former Portland Timbers player who was still Brian doing Fernandez. drugs, yeah. even though they said that he was not doing drugs, and that kind of has devolved into a whole issue, and it makes it difficult for us because- single entity to do business with a club that's facing a lawsuit yeah. so it was a whole it's possible that it could be that situation where uh we had to sell uh or yeah basically he had to go to tijuana because it was a tijuana swap deal that him. was a little bit complicated essentially it was basically he, he had, yeah it was instead of going a to b it had to go a to b to c and right. that kind of complicated the whole thing right it could have been that i don't think that's longer. been confirmed and so that's where it is uh yeah i mean if it is that it's very interesting because that type of complexity in that type of deal, it's only probably because of MLS. Yeah, it's you know, definitely yeah. an MLS thing. Like, I feel like MLS just makes things more complicated than it has to be. And if that's the case and the deal had to work that way, then I understand how long it took, but also right. that's some outside of the box thinking from the front office. So credit to them where credit's due. But mm -hmm. the main topic is the fact that LGP is gone. He played well. If you watch the game, literally the exact same LGP that we're all used to seeing. Exactly. Yeah, he uh, shithoused a lot. He, <laughs> <laughs> he had like a a foul that was like hurting a guy in the first five minutes. It was just like, yep, that's just very on brand. Right, but he's part of, uh, yeah, Cholos' big kind of push in 
kind of shoring up their defensive uh, line. And so really important in that uh, he's a big cog in their, um, you know, in kind of reinforcements. And so that's great for them. But for us, it's definitely losing a club legend. I mean, he's definitely uh, one of the stalwarts in all of our, uh, you know, cup wins essentially. And so whether- Second most appearances. Yeah, second most appearances. I mean, he's a guy that I, I think definitely uh, inside the locker room commanded a lot of, uh, you know, just uh, his leadership was super key. Uh, on the field, he was definitely kind of the, you know, um, kind of almost a translator at times for uh, kind of the more of those Spanish speaking guys that maybe aren't as adept at English. And so, yeah, he's a guy that uh, is that glue guy, really brought people under his wing and uh, in terms of new guys. And so he will really, I think, uh, be missed because he is a guy that um, I think we all know just how important he really was. Uh, there are the naysayers that uh, like to slag him off because of uh, you know his faults, but I think at the end of the day, he really I think uh, you know was part of a lot of the um, kind of you know top defender lists every single season that he was in uh, Atlanta. So I think you know best wishes to him at Cholos. But uh, he also spoke with the Athletic afterwards. Um, with Felipe, Felipe Cardenas and uh, talked about him basically not forcing an exit from Atlanta actually. And that, uh, yeah, he was aware of the restrictions kind of as being the part of why he probably had to leave. And um, yeah, it really, you know, he thought this is a kind of step forward for him in terms of Cholos, uh, you know, me, I don't know if the ship has sailed quite yet for him in Argentina, but uh, he might be looked at at a different light uh, playing in Liga MX. So it could be really good for him in terms of if he can get involved in that setup. Uh, I still think maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not quite. Level. Yeah, but it's possible. It's possible. And, you know, if uh, they're really short at the back, it really could uh, be something that he could, uh, you know, become a part of. And so. Uh, absolutely. You know. And I think one of the interesting things you kind of touched on is that he hinted at as well is. It kind of was a move that was out of necessity because of how the rules for MLS are set up. And Jeff Lorenowitz spoke with the media today, we were recording this on a Tuesday, and he kind of went into the same thing. I mean, he said something along the lines of, LGP is a prick in the best sense of it. Yeah. Like, you, you love to have a guy like that on the team because you know that it riles up and messes with the, with the opposition. They don't like facing someone like him because he's a world-class shithouser. But, you know, Larry also admitted the fact that MLS does have these roles in place and it really sucks at times when you have a good player, but you can't afford to pay them their value, especially when they're as good as he is. And you either have the choice of losing them for fear of moving them on. And Lance United unfortunately had to move him on. And, you know, both LGP and Larry talked about it. That's part of the game. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's just one of those things. And, you know, he's not the first and he's not going to be the last. And we're going to have players that leave. That's just the nature of sport. Exactly. But uh, he did mention in his Instagram goodbye post uh, lots of good things, really kind of heartfelt and uh, really talked well about Atlanta and saying that he's forever a five stripe and he would be following this team. So that's really great to see from him. And uh, yeah, there is a possibility because he is still 27. It is possible that he could come back at some point. Uh, maybe not too long, but because <laughs> then if he's in his mid thirties or something like that, uh, it mm. might be, yeah. So, but anyway, uh, let's move on to uh, at least kind of his replacement. Not really, I think, like for like, but uh, he is a ball playing center back and that is Fernando Mesa. Uh, and he comes from Nakaxa, as we alluded to. I like I just like, what's the thing where you flip <laughs> letters? Because that's totally what I did looking at yeah. the thing. Like, where you, what Nakaxa or... No, the, what is the, the thing where you flip letters and you see... Yeah. It? I, don't I can't remember I right now, but that's just basically what happened. Yeah, it, it is a it is a weird looking word if you're not a like Spanish speaker. So it is like I've had to look at it a bunch of times to make sure. Yeah, Nick Nicoxa. Yeah. Anyway, but um, yeah, he's a guy that's um, in terms of transfer fees and all that. It's still Atlanta United have been really close to the vest, and I think a lot of uh, MLS teams are as well in terms of transfer fees and whatnot bandied about. There just isn't really any. And so uh, in terms of how much he costs, it's not out there. But uh, I think, you know, because he's a 29-year-old, um, he's a central defender, but he can also play at right back and central midfield. 
Uh, he's a kind of a guy that has the utility that a Frank DeBoer wants. Uh, ball playing guy, aggressive in the tackle, uh, and actually pretty decent at winning headers, even though he's 5'9". And so, uh, yeah, do you think he's a good addition to our back line? I mean, I think he makes the back line as good as it can be when you lose a player like LGP. They're similar in some ways, different in others. I think he's a bit quicker. Lots of experience. I think yeah. he's a bit quicker um, than LGP in terms of his pace. Um, and he does have that experience, and that's really important. And I think a lot of the journalists today specifically were really impressed with their first interactions with him. And it seems that he has maybe a little bit more of a calmer head at times. Um, but he seems to be a guy that wants to come in and work hard. And, and he might be the type of guy that you'd like to see in a back line with a younger and less experienced Miles Robinson and a Franco Escobar. And if Atlanta does go with a back three, that's not the worst in the world. I mean, you've got a lot of talent on the ball and you've got someone like Miles Robinson who's an incredible one-on-one. -on -one. And you, yeah, you have that aggressiveness that you want in a back line as well. And of course, you have the cover of a Miles Robinson. That's too. a very athletic back line when you look at I it. I mean, so. it allows you, if Frank DeBoer wants to do it, I think that's the type yeah. of back line that allows you to press teams higher up the pitch because right. you have the pace, the recovery, and the athleticism mm -hmm. as well as the skill on the ball mm -hmm. to be able to be more aggressive and put teams in tighter situations. Right, exactly. And so basically, your line can be a little higher up and maybe closer to the uh, the halfway line. Which is good, so. especially when you're playing at home. Look what LAFC yeah. did last season with their high press. I mean, I think Atlanta has the athleticism to do that sort of thing, especially at home if you can force teams into turning the ball over in their defensive third. You've got talent to put the ball in the back of the net very quickly. And I think, you know, that maybe not be what we thought of when DeBoer got the job, but depending on if there's a few more signings that come in that fit that mold, that could very much play into Atlanta's hands into being a more attacking, aggressive team, which fits players like PC Martinez, who played in a similar system at River. So we'll see what happens. And, you know, I've definitely had my question marks about the moves of the front office, but I think this is a good one. We'll see what happens with time. But we're heading in the right direction, I think. So right. we'll see what happens. And I think, yeah, still in at 29, it's still young for MLS years. And so I think he mm -hmm. still has uh, two or three really good years in him. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be a, a massive hindrance at the age that he's at. And this is about the peak time you get for defenders as well. Between like 27, 29, that area is usually when they're at their best. So... Hopefully we're getting the best out of him as well. Yeah, for sure. And also, I mean, uh, in terms of a tidbit from the press as well, uh, he apparently uh, said that he wants to learn English in six months and at least be able to conversate with the reporters. And he challenged the reporters as well to be able to speak to him in Spanish and that he would, uh, if they were to do that, he would speak in English in response in six months time. That's really bold from him, uh, and that's great. You know, I think uh, he's th that type of character is, I think, really good for the team. Someone that uh, is willing to make bold uh, statements, and let's see if he backs it up. Let's see if the reporters back it up. We'll see. I know but. Joe Patrick said he was going to dust off Duolingo, so if I had to put any yeah. bets on the first person to ask a question in Spanish, it'd be him. And it, it cannot be Donde Esta La Biblioteca. That's, yeah, it can't be Where's the Library. Yeah, that that's, doesn't count. That's just like the ultimate troll. But <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so speaking of an addition to the back line, uh, it'll be kind of, uh, you know, maybe a mystery where he's exactly going to be playing quite yet. But uh, it will be Anton Wax has returned an original five stripe from the 2017 season. Uh, he had uh, come from Portsmouth or Pompeii and... Uh, he Pompey. had been pumping, but uh, he had been playing uh, as a defensive midfielder and a fullback as well for them. Uh, not really as much as center back, but when he was brought in, Carlos Bocanegra said that it would be an addition to our back line. So you know that maybe might mean also he might play some center back. So it might be really good in terms of the utility as well for another guy that can play at multiple positions. Something that is very, very good for all the competitions that we're in. Uh, I think, yeah, he will see probably kind of really spot starts in a lot of those, uh, those you know, positions and probably not be quite as much a starter for us per se as he was in the 2017 season. Yeah, I think if everyone's fit, given that um, you sign a couple more players in certain positions, I don't think he's a person that is in your starting 11. But in terms of the level of play, you know he can play in MLS. And 
I would imagine he would have improved playing. Mind you, you know, Pompey played in League One over in England. That's the third division of English football. Um, and even some of their fans were kind of slagging him off, saying he wasn't even that good for them. But that's a different story. Pompey fans are usually pretty miserable bastards. They'll admit that themselves. Um, but I think he's a player, again, familiar with the league, can play at this level, is improved from when he left, is older, more experienced. But like you said, the most important thing is he's a depth signer that can play in a lot of different positions. And that's something that Atlanta United wants. And I think especially in MLS, if you can find quality players that can play multiple positions, it helps you with the fact that you don't have as much money and you can't have too deep everywhere. But if you have someone that can play in those spots, that really does a massive solid for you. It makes your bench a whole lot stronger right. as well. Uh, the only sad part about this is that Brandon Vasquez is not here for him to for them to resume their Branton bromance that uh, was so really just heartwarming to see in the 2017 season. But yeah, it, I think they'll still they they're DMing each other, uh, you know, as we speak, probably. So we're we're good on. Well, they'll see each other at least twice a year when we play since. So. Exactly. So it'll be fun. But uh, yeah, so uh, Carlos Bocanegra also talked about how all the players that we're bringing in, we feel like they'll be ready to go for Champions League, uh, and so that's uh, really key. But he also said that we're a tad bit behind schedule for various reasons. With that, to be completely honest, but we will be getting them in the next few days and then they'll hit the ground running. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's vital in that he has that kind of timetable in mind that they all need to be ready for that. I mean, that's why we're, uh, you know, holding preseason a week earlier than most of the other clubs. And so it should be all kind of funneling into that, uh, that goal of being ready for Champions League because we definitely, maybe we're a little kind of caught off guard last season in terms of that but well, you had the whole uncertainty with well you not uncertainty but you knew miggy was leaving you just didn't know when you knew pt martinez was coming but you didn't know when yeah. um and then obviously you have a new coach so there was a lot of you know upheaval last year in terms of uncertainty and making things not the most ideal for your maiden champions league campaign mm -hmm. um i think that as we'll get into in a little bit the still two main rumors are still going to be via santi and arzamendi in terms of those arriving i think that's what everyone's looking forward to to see if it's one of those two if not both mm -hmm. um those have been the strongest links although that being said anton walks kind of came out of nowhere so yeah there was the that club? early early link earlier in the day that uh essentially was saying that uh poppy was trying to um, you know, pretty much the yeah, pretty much move them. And uh, there was an MLS team that might be interested, and some people kind of prognosticated would it be Atlanta, and turned out to be. And so it <laughs> boom, was, it's just like there it yeah. is. So it can't, one day's time. Wouldn't it be the first time that the front office just pulls something out of nowhere? But you know, you'd like to have them in sooner rather than later. Although that being said, they're still with Paraguay for the U23 qualifying for the yes. Olympics. In terms of Arzamendia and Viasanti, so, yeah. In terms of that, um, yeah, there is still a little bit of the waiting game. Uh, their president said that there have been no offers yet, but there has been interest apparently. Uh, and according to Roberto Rojas, uh, the BN Sports reporter, that uh, he spoke to their agent and their agent said that there is interest in that, uh, you know, there could be an offer, but you know, it's just, nothing is transpiring at the moment. Now that being said, so. that could all be a complete smoke screen and there could yeah. be offers. That's one of the things that those teams do. But right. I think it is important that, you know, I definitely had a little bit of criticism last week for Cross Book and Egger in terms of the timeline of getting these things done. But the fact that he's open and candid in his response talking about these things is important. Um, but yes, I think it's sooner rather than later to get those guys in so that Atlanta can really be on strong footing going to the Champions League is the most important thing. But also making sure that the guys from last year are fit is kind of important as well. Yeah. And speaking of one of those guys, George Bello is one of those key guys that, uh, you know, if he's being, uh, in terms of the competition at left back, or if he's the heir apparent uh, in the role, yeah, it really is right now, uh, Carlos Bocanegra has spoken that he's really, uh, really a big year for George, um, and that they will be bringing in some competition at that position, so... Uh, yeah, he kind of has to, it's not quite make or break, but he does have to prove himself in terms of George Bellow. Uh, yeah, we'll rifle through a lot of these uh, kind of topics that we kind of spoke about uh, in a transfer daily. You can find it in the card above or uh, on the podcast. Just hop over to YouTube and, and click on that if you haven't checked it out. But uh, basically, some uh, kind of quick hits on some of those players. Um, 
in terms of, uh, yeah, midfielder is definitely a kind of key position that we're looking at. And that's, uh, of course, to replace the production of a Jonathan Nagby. Very, very vital, of course. Uh, in terms of Miles Robinson, he has been, he's fully recovered from that uh, kind of really annoying injury that he uh, suffered at the U.S. Men's National Team camp. The fact um, that they even thought they could get him for this month as well. Uh, Never going to happen. Always yeah. Comes. And uh, and so we actually did say no to uh, the U.S. Men's National Team in terms of letting Brad Guzan, Miles Robinson, etc. to be able to go into the camp. I think they knew and understood as well that, yes, we have CCL to really contend with and worry about. Uh, and Jeff Lorenowitz, he also, uh, yeah, that he could be a week or so behind. We found out today that he had anthroscopic surgery on his left knee to clean out cartilage, which just sounds ooh, painful. Yeah, but um, yeah, he did that on December 27th, but he did run today on Tuesday uh, during the training session. So uh, that's, yeah, I mean, the timetable still puts him ready, I think, for the second exhibition game on January 29th. So that should be good. Um, yeah, he'll still probably travel with the team and just probably take part, but not He's really. Like the dads. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and someone's got to read the newspaper. <laughs> someone's got to. Yep, yeah, exactly. But um, and uh, in terms of captain speak or captain talk, uh, it probably is between Lorenowitz and Guzan uh, per Frank Gabor. So you know we'll we'll find. Whichever one doesn't get it, they'll be vice captains. So. Right. So, uh, I mean, yes, it, maybe they're both not like the ideal one in terms of uh, one maybe not be you know playing every single game. Guzan, not an outfield player traditionally. Uh, a lot of people like more of an outfield player to be the captain as you can, you know. This might be a little overrated, I feel like sometimes, but just be able to speak to the ref and whatnot. But I think, you know, a lot of players on the pitch, as long as they can communicate with the ref, you can speak to them. It's just a matter of if the ref is, gonna be a you know maybe a dick or not and <laughs> be like only your captain can speak to me you know and that's kind of annoying but uh and then so Guzan will just have to run out with his tremendous pace that he's got according to FIFA <laughs> to do that but anyway so uh moving on from that uh Joseph Martinez has uh said that he had played with a pretty significant tear in the Toronto Eastern Conference Finals match and that he's still working on a full recovery and uh, that he described his hamstring injury from last season as a three centimeter tear that he played through. Ooh, um, I'm not a medical person, but I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that's not good and not ideal and probably should not be playing on it. Um, yeah, I think we saw that he was kind of really visibly uh, not himself during the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, there, you know, the penalty, the just uh, the touches just wasn't kind of primo Jose Martinez. And so that's, you know, we don't want any more of that. I think it's more that if he needs the time to recover, recover, man. And, and he's talked about people were asking him, you know, if he would take time off and he said no. And it's like, look, I love Joseph Martinez. I love his fiery attitude. I think it's important. But also, and this kind of builds off something we were talking about before we started filming with Frank DeBoer last year, basically saying if Joseph wants to start, Joseph starts. And it's like, mm, you're the manager, you probably should be able to make that decision. That final say um, should go with Frank DeBoer. The yeah, medical so. team and the manager should make that decision, in yeah. my opinion. I think that's what you're there for, that's why you're hired. You're the one where the buck stops, not the players. Um, and sometimes players have to be protected from their own competitiveness. And I think that the important thing with Joseph Martinez is, as much as I love that, he has he needs to be here for a long time, not just a good time. And I want him to have a long career at Atlanta United. And hamstrings are very finicky injuries that if you don't take care of them and don't allow them to heal properly, they rob you of a lot of pace and a lot of what makes you good. I mean, if anyone's an older fan of soccer, look at Michael Owen. Michael Owen was one of the best players in the world around the turn of the 2000s. He really messed up his hamstring and he was never the same player after that. And with Joseph, Three centimeter tear. Again, I'm not a medical expert. That does not sound good. If someone is a medical expert, get down in the comments. Let us know. But I would rather him get be healthy. Martinez I'd rather him be healthy than playing through injury. Yeah. That's but important. Good luck again telling Joseph Martinez that. So. Yeah. So. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he was also talked, uh, or he was asked about uh, potentially competing with Chicharito uh, for the MLS Golden Boot if he does kind of really you know, make his long rumored move to LA Galaxy. 
Uh, and he said, I think the competition I have right now for my spot is with Tito Fischalba. And I think that's uh, poignant, because yeah, I mean, right now also, we don't really have an out-and-out -out backup striker as well. Tito has played there in the past, but right now uh, we don't. But there is a guy in camp uh, that might be a, a person that, uh, you know, might be signed. We don't know quite yet. This is, again, filmed on a Tuesday. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the player is an Adam John, and so uh, he has previously played with Columbus Crew. He, uh, when he famously shut us up with the, you know, kind of essentially game-winning penalty, essentially to put it away, uh, and uh, in the 2017 uh, MLS playoffs, which was very annoying, and I haven't forgotten that. <laughs> I haven't forgotten that, M. John. But if you do become a five stripe, and uh, if you are signed, I will root for you. But <laughs> you will have to make amends for that, I feel like. But uh, he has recently played for Phoenix Rising in the USL Championship, and he scored 17 goals and seven had seven assists and made the USL best 11. So is he maybe the backup striker that uh, is in camp and could provide what we need? Maybe so. We'll I mean, as far as backup strikers go, I think Tudu Vijal was not the worst option in the world. Right. Um, if he's going to stay and you can have him in that role, I'd like to see that. I mean, mm -hmm. you could play two off the top with him and Joseph. That could be interesting. And mm -hmm. if he has to make a spot start here for you know for Joseph, I'd feel comfortable with him because you know what you get, you know what the pace you get. But still, it's nice to have sometimes three strikers there, especially if you end up playing with two up top at times in a 3-5-2. So we'll see what happens, but still, not yep. the worst thing in the world, especially for what looks like 100000 in terms of a transfer. So in terms of transfer fee, yeah, which is kind of high for USL. I think their record one was 200,000 uh, still. I mean, that's a pretty hefty transfer fee, but still, if he provides what we want, you know, there is that difficulty in getting a backup striker because, you know, if they're good enough, then they probably want to start. And so it's just if you sign for Atlanta United line. as a striker, you know you're not starting because Joseph yeah. Martinez. Is <laughs> exactly, he's that guy in front of you, and he's scoring like 30 goals a season. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be difficult maybe for you he's to get a lot. He's pushing as a goat MLS player, and he's only gonna be going into his fourth season. Exactly. So. But anyway, uh, another thing that came out of training and the leaks galore. Uh, we'll go with the first leak. Uh, we won't blame who or whichever, but uh, Eric Rometty, uh has been. Yeah, at least in terms of his number, he leaked his number, number five, LGP's old number. Uh, I think also, it's his favorite number as well. It's his favorite number, it's like tattooed, tattooed on him. So uh, it makes sense that it's he like, would sweet. grab it. See you, Leandro. <laughs> that number's mine, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All those ugly jokes that you uh, bandied at me, I'm a happier number now. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it also showed the training kit that I think now we've all seen, but uh, it was red and then Right behind it was the gray one and black one. Uh, I think, yeah, they're fresh, uh, although they're maybe a little template-y, but still, they look good. They're simple. They'll but be out next like month them. for everyone that keeps calling the team store and asking. <laughs> they're not going to be here in January. They'll be out in February. Please stop calling. Maybe. But uh, <laughs> another leak uh, in terms of, uh, you know, someone that was in one of the kind of squad photos after training it was Edgar Castillo, a 33-year-old left back that had previously played for the Revs uh, and also has a lot of Liga MX experience. But uh, yeah, he might be on trial. It's one of those things where they're trying to sort out a contract. And so is he that left back kind of that Boca was talking about or is it someone that uh, just is being brought in as competition and cover? Uh, because yes, we will need uh, in one sense, bodies as well, so. I think he's a depth signing and a cover signing yeah. and also gives you a bit more experience if you have to, so. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of a bigger guy as well, so I think he could provide you a bit more of a physical option depending on where you were in a game, the situation, so. True. But I still think when you talk about competing for that left back spot, I don't think you're bringing in a 33 year old to compete at left back. I think he's more of a guy that's there. Compete and to bring the experience of, Yeah, and well. to bring the experience. Intangibles. Compete makes me think of someone who's a starter level. Sure. I just don't see that from him as a starter sure. on the left back. Yes, yeah. but um, all right, so moving on from that uh, it is the CBA update and there's some crazy things being uh, said as maybe what's uh, being part of it. Uh, one of them is that the DP age will be kind of hard and fast to be under 23, uh, and then if you're older older than 23, you might have to be sold. I mean, it's, it's a stupid idea, and I don't think it will end up working. Yeah, and that's re reporting uh, from The Athletic. And I think the intention crazy, was but... to try to like 
force teams to like basically Go buy young players exactly. and then sell them on, which is I think novel, but you shouldn't have to make teams do that. And I think the example was, is that if that had been a rule, that really great Toronto side that won, I guess, Couldn't have it. you yeah. could have travel with the Can Canadian Cup, it doesn't really count, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> um, wouldn't have ever happened, yeah, because yeah. they wouldn't have been allowed to have all those players over that age and mm -hmm. paid that much money. I, I think the league needs to, that's one of my things, the league needs to step, take a step back and worry less about what the teams do and let them kind of construct their rosters themselves and not have as much of a hand in what they can and can't do and make it less regimented because at this point, it should be on the teams, not on the league, to make themselves competitive, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, and Jeff Lerowitz also spoke with the media about uh, the CBA negotiations. He's also on the MLSPA board, and he said pretty much that discussions are ongoing, uh, but there's they're not ready to sign anything. The process is ongoing, um, and yeah, that they're they're hopeful, and that's yeah, they uh, there are passing of proposals, so. That's, I think, progress, but uh, January 31st is, or 31 is still coming very quickly, so yes, please get that done, guys. But uh, anyway, moving on to LNA2, technically, in a, in a sense, uh, Andrew Carlton has been uh, rumored to be going to USL side ND11 on loan for the whole 2020 season, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty interesting move for him. It's a team that is, I think, fairly uh, got their kind of starting uh, positions, I think, set in place. And so you really have to earn a spot. What does that do for Carlton? I think for game? me, I think it's a good idea. I think you get him out of his comfort zone and you make him really have to become professional at this point. Mm -hmm. He's not at home. He's not going to be surrounded by his friends and family, the people he's used to. It's a real big growing up moment for him because mm -hmm. I think for him, it's a make or break thing with Atlanta United. If he goes to Indy 11, gets his head down, works his, you know, his, his ass off and, and gets into that lineup and starts being a contributor for that team and really progresses, then he gives himself a great shot to come back to Atlanta United and have a roster spot and compete for playing time in 2021. If he goes and has an unsuccessful season, then I think unfortunately that might be the end of his chances with Atlanta United because they're going to say, well, if you couldn't do it at that level, how do you expect to do it at our level? Because not only is Atlanta United MLS, it's the upper end of MLS and they expect high results and it's a bit of a cutthroat environment. You have to be good and you have to be working hard all the time and if you're not doing that, you're not going to get a shot at top clubs. So I wish him the best of luck and I hope he lights it up in the USL because that'll you know, like I said, give him a great shot here in 2021. Yeah. Uh, so moving on from that, uh, Lee United 2 made some announcements on players. Midfielder Daniel Steedman, a kind of versatile attacking player and had a really great collegiate career, according to Stephen Glass. And uh, as well, they selected a forward, Philip Goodrum from UNC Wilmington with the 75th overall pick in the MLS Super Draft. Uh, and then he was already signed with Atlanta too. Uh, during the four years that he was at UNC Wilmington, he had 32 goals and 15 assists in 76 career appearances. Not too shabby. Uh, and then also, uh, this, this guy, I think, caught my attention today. Uh, but 24-year-old midfielder Bubakar G. Uh, from North Carolina Wesleyan College. Uh, he's kind of a versatile guy, kind of a versatile midfielder that can really uh, you know, be pretty sound defensively, get forward, score some goals. He had 34 goals and 19 assists in uh, 57 appearances. Not any bad, bad. any yeah. bad uh, production from a midfielder. Let's see what he can do with the, with the twos this year. Yeah, and he looked like he had some pace in yeah. some of the, the videos that uh, Elena 2 were putting up, so. Yeah, I, I like what I see from that guy. And um, yeah, I think LA2 are strengthening their uh, core squad. Maybe, uh, you know, they are seeing kind of the transgress transgressions from yesteryear in terms of not having really enough of a core to actually play, um, you know, with a starting 11 that you're playing every single match. And so maybe it really is at this point, you know, they're really getting more players that uh, they feel like will be part of the setup for a longer term. But um, yeah, and so moving on from that, Miggy has scored again. And uh, yeah, he's just lighting it up uh, four in seven games. Uh, he scored against Rockdale again in the FA Cup. And uh, yeah, it was quite a, there was a right footed one and then now a left footed one. I mean, not too bad, not too bad. So, uh, you know, Miggy scoring and I think uh, kind of disproving some of the naysayers that have been hounding him 
at uh, not only Newcastle, but just anybody that looks at MLS talent and that goes for a kind of heftier transfer fee. I think he's uh, kind of slightly shutting them up. Keep going, keep it going, Niggy. But uh, that does it for the news. Whew, that was a lot. Uh, thank you guys for getting through it with all of us. But uh, yeah, moving on to buy or sell. And simply, we put up an LA United related topic and we say if we buy it or sell it and why. So first topic is that Miles Robinson, he was uh, he was named as uh, one of the top 10 American players in MLS. And we'll show this list. Uh, some really good names, I feel like. Uh, but should he be in the top five of the top 10 best American players in MLS? Buy I sell it for right now. Um, there's the saying that, you know, Form is temporary and class is permanent. Miles Robinson had incredible form for the 2019 MLS season. That being said, the players above him, especially the defenders, look at an Ike Parr and Aaron Long. They've been doing it for a few years now. They've been doing it for a while. I'm talking to Nagby. We know what you get from him. Um, so I think that it's something that he can do. And I think that if he has another season like he had in 2019, he will A, easily be in that list and B, start angling himself for a move to Europe because if he has that form and keeps improving the way that he did last year, he's too good for this league. So we'll see what happens and you know, I hope he continues his, his improvement for Atlanta United because if Miles Robinson keeps getting better, that's really good for the five strikes. Indeed. And uh, yeah, I, I saw it as well. Yeah, it is maybe a little early uh, and uh, it was surprising that he was on this list maybe uh, to a degree, but I think, you know, with his just incredible form last year, I think it should be no surprise really for most people. Uh, in terms of Darnton Nagby being right in front of him on the list, I feel like that's on purpose. It's like all the, the people that are like, oh, should he be in the top five? But Nagby's right in front of him. That's tough. So it's probably, yeah, where he's at is probably a really, really good spot. So uh, moving on from that, uh, next topic is Miggy will hit double digits and goals in all competitions for Newcastle in the, this uh, until the end of the season. Buy or sell? I'm going to sell because Newcastle is like a 99% chance of getting knocked out in the next round of the FA Cup because they just don't go far in that competition anymore. Um, although they'll have, I think, Watford or Tranmere, if I believe correctly. Oh, or is that the United Tran? It doesn't matter. Point being is that he will have the league and maybe one or two more games in the FA Cup. And I don't see him scoring six more goals, um, unfortunately. I think that if he can get seven, eight, nine, that's great for him, especially building off of last year. Um, I just don't see him getting 10 goals in all competitions. I, I like for him to, but maybe I'll be wrong. Yeah, I also sell it as well. I think, yeah, it's going to be difficult because the just the Premier League competition is just really, really difficult uh, in terms of that he scored two against a lower level competition. So, I mean, yeah, if they make a magical cup run, then, you know, maybe that could happen. Maybe that mm -hmm. could happen. So, but I think for now, I sell it. So anyway, that gets us done uh, with buy or sell and moves us on to the mailbag. You guys send in these questions through IG story. Please continue to do so and we might answer your question in the future. First question comes from Josemar Medina. How likely are we to see FDB go back to the 3-4-3 this year? Can it actually work this time? I think it depends on who comes in at left back. I think if you get a guy like Arzamendia, then absolutely because he offers you so much in terms of that dynamism going down the side. Um, and you know, if you get a guy like Villasanti in as well, it gives you a lot in midfield. I wouldn't feel comfortable necessarily running a midfield two of your two out and out midfielders being Eric Rometty and uh, Emerson Hyman. I just don't feel that they give you enough in terms of covering the ground. Hyman is more natural to go forward and Rometty is kind of like a guy that if you have someone behind him, he's perfect because he can close guys down and go win tackles. But in terms of that positional discipline, he kind of lacks that sometimes, um, which is why when he kind of dropped out of the side and you saw Jeff Lorenz come in, the team was more stable. Mm -hmm. um, three, four, three, I think it could be something that works. You could see it. I just don't necessarily that's what we're gonna go with. Yeah, I think that's the really, the big difficulty here uh, is that midfield, that balance really needs to be just the most of utmost importance, I feel like, because, uh, for the reasons that you spoke about, but also I think, um, you know, even with the Dunton Nagby as part of that too, we struggled at times. I think bringing anybody else, yeah, we need to kind of at least have three guys in our midfield to really, I think, 
have more control uh, than what we were experiencing uh, in our kind of really bad spells last season. Uh, so Not to mention that Barco is more comfortable being in the middle as a starting position as opposed right. to coming off the wing. PT right. is comfortable coming off the wing and cutting inside, but for Barco, he very much prefers to be in that central part of the pitch. Right, and so I think uh, a more of a 3-5-2 in terms of like PT being more upfield and then uh, Barco kind of dropping back a little bit into the hole. Yeah, that's a little bit more where I think it fits and kind of we have more balance. So yeah, three four three is just a little too flat, leaves us a little too open in midfield. So um, yeah, I, if we see it, I don't know. I, 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 I think the one positive <laughs> that you could say Atar, as far as formation goes is that with the players that Lane Edit are signing, it gives them the flexibility of playing a multitude of formations because the players can play in a number of positions. So mm -hmm. we'll certainly see. I think Lane Edit, if they're smart, will have one or two different formations that they really focus on. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's good to have one as a back three and one as a back four that you're comfortable in. I just don't know if 343 will be the exact one that they go with. Right. Uh, next question comes from Charu Creation. Why is, I would presume, everyone leaving? Um, I, I get that there's that feeling, and I understand it. Uh, you know, we, I kind of we get this kind of comment on across social media, and uh, in terms of that, yes, yeah, there are big players that have left LGP. You know, it's but I think there are players. Uh, that are coming in that's I think are gonna provide a lot um, and I think yeah the prevailing feeling of course yeah you know, like you have rumors of Gressel uh, you know not being uh, paid you have Barco rumors you have PT rumors it feels like oh where's our team but if you look at the core of it there still is like if you look at our starting 11 it's very very solid and really it's about kind of filling out that depth and uh, getting at least yeah two guys at his position, so to speak, uh, that can really, I think, inspire confidence. And so, uh, yeah, I get what you're feeling, but I feel like, you know, there are so many moves to come, so it's really not that quite, like, doom and gloom quite yet. Yeah, and also, I mean, it's just, it's, without sounding blasé about it, it's just one of the aspects mm -hmm. of the sport. You're going to have players that come and go, and I think the thing that you can really say is, is that for a lot of people, you know, your favorite player hasn't even played for Atlanta United yet, and they're going to leave at some point in time. That's just how things are. I mean, we're going to have players that come in now that, you know, in the future that we're going to love so much more than maybe even the players that we've already had. And it's just like, man, now they're going to go. It's just how sports go. And the best teams as well are constantly refreshing their teams. That's something that under the Ferguson regime at Manchester United, he was incredible at, which is he built three, four teams where he kept bringing in new players because sometimes you can get a bit complacent. That's something that happened at Tottenham when you saw that they weren't making transfers. And some of those players that they know and love needed to be moved on so that the team could move on. And as much as we love the players, it has to remember the most important thing at the end of the day is the club, is the team, is what's best for Atlanta United. And sometimes that means letting go of the players that we love the most, and it doesn't feel good, but it's something that as fans, we have to get used to regardless. Yeah, and of course, we're not saying that you shouldn't be sad if you're, one of your favorite players leaves, but it's just kind of part of the business, part and parcel, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, it, it really is. You have to love the badge. It really is. But um, next question comes from Bell 6 Why do you think they haven't moved Tito? Not that I'm complaining, just surprised. It is very interesting. Um, they have mentioned uh, during the offseason that they are open to uh, moving him if uh, that is the, you know... If the terms, right offer comes yeah, in. Yeah, if the right offer comes in. But in terms of uh, Tito, yeah, he still had, I think, could play a big part in this team because he offers so much. Uh, and if he were to, you know, maybe learn a wingback position, maybe that would be something that uh, would get him into the team even, uh, you know, sooner, quicker. But uh, yeah, I think he is kind of one of those uh, probably first options off of the bench, if not an out and out starter for any MLS team, really, uh, if he were to be moved. But I think we would all want him to be moved outside of MLS if it were. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I mean, if you have to go with a backup striker and you can't bring anyone in right now because you're focused on other positions, I think you could do a whole lot worse than Tito Vijalba. Yes, it's not his natural position, but he has played it and I think he can play it. He is a different player to Joseph Martinez in terms of how he plays that position, but sometimes having someone that can change things up isn't the worst thing in the world. He provides you depth and again, he can start at any point in time for Atlanta United and you don't, you wouldn't have a massive drop off in quality and production. I think for him this year, his main focus is going to be staying fit. He had a real problem with injuries last year and that really 
hampered both his chances of getting into the team and when he was in the team, he just didn't always look fully fit his right. full self like we saw in 2017 and 2018. Yeah, indeed. But uh, next question comes from Arish Baliani. What is one thing that can get Atlanta United over the hump this season to win MLS Cup? I think for me, you know, especially if you can get a player in like a Viasanti or an Arzamendia or both, you get that solid production in midfield because even though you had a Darlington Nagby, it wasn't something you got in terms of goals and assists. You didn't get a lot of those coming directly out of your midfielders. If you can get your midfield to be able to provide you more, and I think you have something like that in Emerson Hyndman, you can open things up for your forward players. It gives a lot more to Joseph Martinez, to an Ezequiel Barco, to a PT Martinez. If Atlantis United can start expanding where those goals are coming from in terms of production and also areas on the pitch, then I think that will make them even more unpredictable and harder to defend against, which will get them over the top. Right, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely, you know, the goals coming from midfield or at least that midfield area or even outside of the box, uh, it just doesn't feel like there were as many kind of dynamic uh, type of goals as yesteryear. And so, yeah, I think, you know, bringing in really, I think, uh, you know, elite level in terms of MLS to be able to, to play in those positions, I think is vital in terms of the ambition that LA United have. And so it's, yeah, pretty important that uh, if we can, you know, shore up those positions that we've lost some really key guys in, then great. So. I think it kind of touches on, you know, when you lose a guy like Greg Garza on the left, mm -hmm. you, last season, Atlanta United, I felt like, were a lot more predictable in yeah. attack. Mm -hmm. And you didn't get as much from the left-hand side, and teams knew most of the time that if crosses were coming in from out wide, it was gonna come from a Julian Russell from the right-hand side. And in terms of, you know, play through the middle, teams were stifling that at times, and so they knew the ball had to go to Joseph. If you could get a guy like Arzamendia, and we've talked about this before, where you have delivery and service coming from the left and the right, from deep and from the byline, opens things up for your guys like like PT and Barco because now fullbacks and defenders and midfielders have to go, well, who am I going with? Because they have to go with somebody. That is what can make a team like Atlanta, who has the quality of players to be more effective in front of goal. If you can do that, it'll be so much harder to defend against. And if Atlanta United can be more flexible, that makes them one of the favorites, if not the favorite, to go for MLS Cup next season. Yeah, agreed. Uh, last question comes from Terminus United 83. Why don't we have a better relationship with Ajax and getting players from them? Um, I guess the nicest way to say this is that even bad players for Ajax, bad, um, are good enough to play in other leagues in Europe. And for them coming to MLS and then trying to succeed here and then move on is harder. And teams in Europe aren't scouting here nearly as much as they are scouting other teams in Europe. It's cheaper for them. Um, so if those players, they just don't have a reason to leave home. They're closer to home, everything's closer to together, and they have, if they know they perform in Europe, then they'll move within the European system, and they just don't have much of a reason to come to MLS. Right, and it's also, I mean, in the Eredivisie, it's like, definitely, you know, they kind of, it's not as diverse as MLS as well. So let's say that. And so it's just like, it's difficult probably for uh, them to, you know, have the ambition of wanting to move over here very early on, and especially if they're an academy product. But, you know, stranger things have happened. It could very well happen that, uh, you know, we are opening up these international spots for some guys like this. So it could happen. Who knows? Especially if that CBA kind of loosens up you never know what could happen. So Not that um, Atlanta has a problem with international slots anyway. I don't think so. Not at all. But anyway, thank you guys for sending in those questions. That pretty much does it for the entire show, except for the question of the day. And the question of the day is this, guys. Are you confident in Fernando Mesa, Franco Escobar, and Miles Robinson as our center backs for this coming season? Get down in the comments below and let us know what you guys have to say. But guys, that's it for us today. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Smash that like button and share this video because it really does help us a lot. And for Tanner, I'm AJ. Thank you guys so much for watching.